Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and I'm going to do something I don't do very often. I'm going to talk about not just Ripple and XRP in this video, but I'm going to talk about Stellar and XLM and I'm going to talk about Ethereum 2.0 and I'll get to why I'm doing that. Now, if you hear anybody while I'm doing this video, I have some guys here at my house that are working. My TV that I had outside went out. Um, I made the mistake of buying one of those cheap um, high sense Walmart TVs and I tried to reset the thing and reset the thing and it never would reset. Uh, it, it lasted me about not very long. It lasted me just a few uh, months and then all of a sudden it just kept blinking on and off and I tried to reset, watch the YouTube videos and it didn't work. So I'm having it replaced. Um, but so if you hear anybody drilling or anything like that, that's what's going on. We're going to start this video off with something we don't get very often. We're going to start it off with Chris Larson, the block stars with David Schwartz, his new podcast. He launched it today. They had three episodes. I've only been through one so far. I wanted to play you the, the two parts for, from Chris Larson that I thought were important. The first one is right here. If I can get it to play. Let me do a refresh and see if we can get that to play the way I want it to. All right, hold on one sec. We're going to go down to here. We're going to hit play. It's a really. All right, here we go. Reaching the point where they could make some sort of an impact. Yeah, no, I think I think that's exactly right. You know, sometimes I kind of look back at the thing and I mean, it definitely caught it was successful. But given that it, it occurred during the financial crisis, I always kind of like wonder, would it have been more successful if it, would, it had been spawned by the Occupy Wall Street group? Because it actually wasn't, right? It was, it was, I think as far as we know, it was created in, in more of the kind of the tech utopian world, the world that, you know, for better or for worse, we're, we're all a part of. And it was, it was formed and, you know, kind of taken to the next level by that group of people with their belief systems which is very different from i think there was a tell just there and actually i was talking to mr b about this and he's the one that spotted this um he just he, he, it was like uh chris larson almost caught himself is what i thought that was like and uh and mr b kind of relayed a similar feeling is like he said it was the tech group as far as we know well i've been around for a while folks and i don't think bitcoin was created by uh, a tech group at all. I think it was created by some government. I don't know which one, but I don't think this just happened. I don't think Sadoshi Nakamoto is some tech group or some nerd that was in his bathrobe. I don't think this how that's how this went down. I think that it was created to look like a libertarian movement, and that was by design. That's what I believe. Now let's take you. Now I'm going to take you to the part where he talks about the interledger. Uh, the XR, XRP anyway, um, David Schwartz asks him about XRP specifically, and he has a pretty good long answer that's worthy of your hearing, in my opinion. 2030, and just like the internet itself, 20 years into it, you know, it's still a work in progress, but it's made incredible changes in, in people's lives. And I think that's what you're going to see with these distributed ledgers being the core part of, of this internet of value. So let's talk for a bit about XRP and the XRP ledger, the distributed ledger that we built to hold the XRP digital asset. It also has a decentralized exchange, supports issued assets, doesn't have mining, confirmations are final. Supports issued assets, don't forget that. How do those technologies enable the internet of value? Yeah, first and foremost, it has to. these have to be fast, extremely inexpensive. They've got to be open to everybody so it can't be this idea of private distributed ledgers i just don't i don't buy that so uh, those are those are key components when it comes to payments it has to be deterministic it cannot be 
History cannot be rewritten, rewritten by anybody, right? So that's, again, a problem with minors. The minors can rewrite history. So that's, uh, I think, why you probably won't see proof-of-work models uh, be the guts of, of the global financial system to take the place of SWIFT and correspondent banking, for example. Whereas I think XRP Ledger, as I think it's already obviously proving to be, can be that replacement to that existing inefficient system. So those are core things. But come back to the energy thing, though, again, that is such a problem. And I just cannot imagine, you know, again, I think Bitcoin will will remain a, a extremely valuable asset. It's going to be obviously part of the mix of where digital assets go. But I think for many uses, it's it's going to become increasingly politically unacceptable to embrace technologies that are contributing that much CO2 to a planet that cannot take any more and needs to be going the other direction. And I think particularly with the new generation, when you start moving away from kind of the Silicon Valley technology, you know, kind of utopian folks, that becomes a much more unacceptable story when you have the Greta's involved and what we're all going to be needing to face up to over the next uh, decades. So I think that's just really, really fundamental. And, and that's something we're real proud of, I think in the XRP ledger, that it doesn't use meaningful amounts of electricity. And by the way, another side consequence of that is that there's proof of work systems, which they actually lead to more centralization, more control by miners. You know, again, Bitcoin's code uh, cannot be changed unless you get the miners to agree to it. And there's lots of conflicts where it wouldn't make sense, as we've seen with some of the forks uh, in the Bitcoin ecosystem have happened. You know, that's a problem. And it's probably, and you know, look, we all have to face also that there is, a, there is a serious question about the mining groups being too weighted to China. And again, I think China's done a masterful job of positioning you know, their industry into those ecosystems, Bitcoin, Ethereum, for example, the proof of uh, work systems. But I think other countries, and particularly the U.S., would, would have to question is that is that something that you want to build a global financial system on? I would say that that would be uh, quite risky, particularly as, unfortunately, I think those two economies are going to be moving into more and more of a competitive challenger, maybe even something a little bit more unfortunate posture. Uh, that, that looks like that's a very clear trend that we're going into. So those are those are concerns as well. And you just don't have those concerns in consensus systems like the XRP ledger. So take us into a utopian future. If these technologies do deliver on their promise, what do we get? Oh, well, I think uh, first stop, is I, I break into two areas. Uh, first stop, though, is that internet of value. When you complete the the third leg of the stool, and you know I can send that shirt for four cents, and I can communicate with anybody in the world on who wants to buy that shirt for four cents or whatever the markup is. But I can also collect the the value that four cents in a way that doesn't add ridiculous amounts of friction fees, and it, it, it isn't a way where I have too many gatekeepers just so I can get to Swift and that correspondent who otherwise aren't going to uh, work with me. So an internet of value, again, it's going to be an open, decentralized system with accessibility to all and completing the picture, which now, you know, again, if you listen to the Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they have calculated, you know, you know, people, those 2 billion people in the developing world, they need to be able to send value in as little as 50 cents in a way that's economical. And in today's world, that's just not possible. And that's why those billions of people are not being served by, by banks, whether they're local banks or international banks, is because the banks cannot serve that kind of a transaction profitably. And in an internet of value world, that's no longer the case. You know, there'll be like that, that shipping company that says, oh, great, yeah, we can, we can send that, ship for four cent, or that shirt for four cents. I'll take that business. That's the kind of system you need, but that's all about dramatically lowering of the cost nearly to zero, you know, accessibility to all and in a way that that operates, not in a way where it's, um, you know, kind of a series of bilateral agreements, which only the big guy. OK, now I want to take you uh, back to what he was saying about Bitcoin. It reminded me of something at the 30 cent mark. This, for your information, is Chris Giancarlo, who is the head of the Digital Dollar Foundation, which is backed by Accenture, which is one of the first investors in Ripple. Listen to what he said about He's also the guy who was in an article that I've shown here that was instructed by the Trump administration to create Bitcoin futures to basically destroy the value of Bitcoin. You'll remember that. And he's from the CFTC. Customs two and three days down to 
instantaneous. That, that Bitcoin was actually created the same year as the financial crisis. Out of that crisis, I think is going to be the seeds of a new financial infrastructure of the future. Yeah. Exactly. This was not an accident. It wasn't by some techie group of libertarians. It was designed to look libertarian. And that right there is what I believe the dirty little, the dirtiest of little secrets is. Now, let's switch gears. Remember, this is the document that Brad Combs and I think um, Mr. Skinny, I, can't, I, always draw, I always forget what he goes by on Twitter. It's something skinny. Anyway, um, the... Uh, there was, <laughs> you know what, I just thought of something. There's also a guy on Howard Stern, um, Howard Stern show that, uh, something skinny and he, he, he like some, he like had clip, he created a website where he had clips of like nude, uh, nudes, nude segments of mainstream films. That's what it reminded me of just now. Um, anyway, global stable coin is um is a term as i said both brad combs and i had never heard until this document well words mean things well look what word just popped up i got this from x men xrp today look what word just packed popped up at the european central bank now remember this this document was from the the financial stability board not from the european central bank well, who runs the European Central Bank? None other, none other than Christine Lagarde, one of the good friends of Ripple, right? A regulatory and financial stability perspective on global stable coins. There's that word again. Prepared by this, 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 and this. Stable coins with potential for global reach. Quote, global stable coins could help to address unmet consumer demand for payment services that are fast, cheap, easy to use, and can operate across borders. However, while there is indeed the potential for such benefits, global stable coins also pose challenges and risks. I'm not going to get into this whole document, but I'm going to make a statement right now, just so you know. I believe that the world we're heading into is, is going to be a world where, where stable coins are being built on the XRP ledger, Stellar, and on what will be Ethereum 2.0. I believe all of them will be in this game. Okay? So, but global stable coins, they have just hatched this word. And if you think for a minute that this was not a bunch of people sitting in a room that coined this term, then think again. This is how these people operate. This is how they get things done. They create a word and then that word is, is said across all of their media platforms and their organizations over and over and over until it's drummed into the world's head. And then it is. It just is at that point. Okay, so I wanted to point out to you, to re just to reinforce this, uh, I said, look who's advertising stablecoin issuance. This is the other day. Um, Stellar was the only company that I found that was advertising stablecoin issuance. I believe this is what it's all about, folks. The stable, and this is what Brad Combs has been talking about. Now look at this. So I, I just went back and started looking. German bank that offered tokenized securities based on Stellar. Munich, uh, this is um, one of the oldest banks in Europe, is developing a special pur purpose euro stable coin that can fit, facilitate private placements and tokenized securities. Now, many of you out there, you think we're all a bunch of weirdos that we're talking about. Oh, you're crazy. You think that these digital assets could replace, could be in the SDR basket with the IMF. That's crazy talk. You're a bunch of conspiracy guys, right? Okay. Well, this is what I found when I was on, when I was, this is from Stellar.org, okay? This is from those guys. They said, exposure to IMF special drawing right is the SDR is no longer only available to central banks. Congrats to Paysin on the launch of their stablecoin using Stellar platform. So this is not fiction. This is not our imagination. These things are going to begin to happen, folks. And there is going to be a need for a private ledger that they launch these things off of. <laughs> There's going to be that need. It's already happening. It's happening behind the scenes, folks. So, and, and if you don't believe me, I clicked on this little link and where, look where it led to the to xdr.com. This is happening, folks. All right. Now, 
So, so then I went and found this little clip. This is Jed McCaleb on stage. I believe that's Jesse Lund. They're both from um, Stellar. Um, you know, from pretty much all the major currencies. Actually, Jed, on this point, right? So the big, obviously, there's a lot of enthusiasm on stable coins. We discussed it this morning. Technically, on this platform, I could use Lumens. I could use, you know, the Stellar coin if you want, or I could use stable coins. What do you think is our, our advantages, actually, for people to use Lumens? And do you believe as we get more and more stable coins, you have, still have a need for it. Right, so, so basically you're not using really one or the other. Like if, if you're, say, in Mexico, you're going to want to use a peso locally, but yeah. when you want to send it, you're, you're converting to something else, right? And so the, the, the question is, like, what do you use as the bridge currency between your pesos and, say, uh, Riai or something yeah. like that, right? And, and you can yeah. either, you, you, so Lumens are a very natural choice just because there's no counterparty, right? And so it's, it's very easy to go between one or the other thing. You don't want to have, like, uh, an exchange between each 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 pair of currencies. You don't want like pesos to rely, pesos right. to yeah, pesos to like all these different currencies in the world because it's just you would just lack liquidity, right? So you need some like currency in the middle that you just have one exchange to, and then you have like order in rather than order in square different combinations. And that's the rule that Lumens are playing. That's where that's where Lumens fit in. It's kind of the bridge between all these different other like stable coins. So, so who do you? Think, I mean, obviously the winners on these. Okay. That's that. So then, then you've got Ripple here. I'm just illustrating to you that they're the, it, these are the ones that are going to be in the game. Investors Ripple ask us, "Hey, we have all these like MSBs, and they're they're sending money across um, with, with XRP using our platform called XRapid, but they don't want to have the currency risk of XRP. Could you guys actually build us a, a stable coin?" Stablecoin proposal. So I thought it might be helpful for me to walk through um, what I have in the design to give people a better idea of how I intended the system to work. Um, so first of all, it's a collateralized stablecoin. Uh, that means tokenized assets whose value is, are expected to remain constant in some unit. So if it's a dollar stablecoin and you have 10 of it, you're expecting its value to remain stable at $10. Um, these assets have a backing asset, in this case XRP. That means that there is something that um, is supposed to guarantee its value. Now, in some of those systems, you can actually redeem the stablecoin for the backing asset. In some, you can't. Um, what's interesting about this proposal is that the stablecoins are perfectly liquid to XRP at face value on the ledger. So in other words, if you have a dollar in a dollar stablecoin designed on the system, what you have is a $1 claim on, X, on, on uh, XRP enforceable by the ledger's payment mechanics. And the reason that that's important is with some other stablecoin designs, if the stablecoin isn't popular, it won't necessarily be liquid. If it's not listed on an exchange, if it can't easily be deposited and withdrawn, it won't be that useful. By the design of this system, the stablecoins can be offered through the on-ledger decentralized exchange, and they spend like XRP. So you don't need to find some way to make them liquid. You can just spend them right on the ledger. And of course, they can be pegged to anything that someone can provide a price feed on. So uh, changes that are in the form of new features. One of the features that I think is, is very exciting is a feature that would allow people to launch um, well, stablecoins are the obvious use case, but it's not just stablecoins. It's essentially assets pegged to some external value. Features similar to that exist on other systems, but the interesting thing about this is that the liquidity is guaranteed by the ledger account. All right. So, and then there's this. This is the um, this is uh, an article about this Chris. Ch the reason I'm showing you this is because, look, these guys are trying to create the digital dollar. It's gonna be on, it's gonna be on some system. Well, I just wanted to read this. The digital dollar would meet the demands of the new digital world and cheaper, faster, and more inclusive global financial system, Giancarlo said. Accenture, which is a Ripple investor, will act as the chief architect and technology partner on the project. In a statement, Accenture Block, Global Blockchain lead and managing partner David Treat said the firm would bring together some of the stakeholders to combine both real-world experience and new technological abilities to drive the project. Giancarlo said Accenture has worked with a number of central banks, including the Bank of Canada, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and the Central European Central Bank to innovate around existing systems. Existing systems, folks. Okay. Now, uh, my the official father of the Digital Asset Investor Channel asked me to find out about Ethereum 2.0 and to find out specifically is Ethereum 2.0 going to, if you have Ethereum and then Ethereum 2.0 comes out, 
Are you going to be able to just, is it going to be a one for one swap? How is this going to work? Well, I found the best answer I've been able to find on BitMEX blog. Okay. They, they did this yesterday. Ethereum 2.0. If you go down here, it says the one way peg. When Ethereum 2.0 launches, there will be two Ethereum networks operating in parallel, ETH1 and ETH2. Initially, it will be possible to convert uh, ETH1 coins into ETH2. However, it will not be possible to convert ETH2 back into ETH1. Therefore, in theory, ETH2 should trade at a price less than or equal to the price of ETH1. However, in the early stages of the transition, it is unlikely that ETH2 will even have a price or be supported by the exchanges as the coin may not be used for anything other than staking. Basic transactions are not even possible. In order to transfer ETH1 into ETH2, one must use the deposit contract on ETH1. This contract essentially destroys the coins on ETH1, and then this destruction can be used as proof to issue new ETH2 coins. The coins are essentially burnt forever, although it may be possible to recover the coins on the ETH1 chain with a hard fork protocol change. Coins transferred to ETH2 automatically go into the proof of stake validator pool. Um, da, da, da. And I won't go any further into that, but I did want to read to you one more part, which addresses what will happen to the price or what they think might happen to the price. Many have asked us what impact the launch of Ethereum 2.0 will have on the price. Of course, in the short term, a significant amount of Ethereum could be locked inside the beacon chain, whatever that means attracted by the ability to earn the new block rewards. This could restrict the supply of Ethereum on the market and drive up the price. On the other hand, it could merely attract Ethereum from other contracts where they're considered locked. However, the real question is whether Ethereum 2.0 will drive long-term value for that. Supply does not only need to be restricted, there needs to be a sustainable demand. In other words, utility. Now, I'm going to end this video by, by talking about something that I never did talk about. And the reason I didn't talk about it is because I was at Swell when it happened. In fact, I remember a conversation with David Schwartz about this. And I remember him tweeting something as well. It's about the Stellar, the Lumen Supply, XLM Supply, okay? It says, unlike, this is from Stellar's website, unlike the tokens of other blockchains, Lumen's aren't mined or awarded by the protocol over time. Instead, 100 billion lumens were created when Stellar Network went live. And for the first five or so years of Stellar's existence, the supply of lumens also increased by 1% annually by de design. That inflation mechanism was ended by a community vote in October 2019. And in November 2019, which is when I was at Swell, and I, I remember David Schwartz even talking about this, the overall lumen supply was reduced. Now there are 50 billion lumens total in existence and no more lumens will be created. In other words, so now they've gone to, they've gotten rid of their inflation me mechanism. So now there will never be more. They literally destroyed half of their supply. There, were, there it says now there's only 50 billion lumens. They, they destroyed over 50 billion XLM in, in November of 2019, folks. Now here's the question. Why? Now, a lot of people thought during Swell that they did it during that time just to just to uh, hopefully make the XLM price go skyrocket and go crazy and and as a slight somehow to ripple. That was the thought pattern. That doesn't really make any sense because what you're talking about is someone destroying four to five billion dollars, as I recall. OK, so here's what they said at the time. This, Stellar's foundation just destroyed half the supply of its lumens cryptocurrency. Um, it says we these are their quotes um, from the, the this lady, Danielle Dixon, I think, runs Stellar. We didn't start by wanting to burn. We started by asking, what do we need? Dixon told the room of roughly 200 attendees as much as we wanted to use the lumens that we held. It was very hard to get them into the market. And then let's see if there's any other quotes. Um, the organization decided instead it was better to, pro to project how much it could actually use over a 10 year period and calibrate to that number to derive a plan from an arbitrary number serves no purpose. Um, the news was great. It says the news was great. Anyway, anyway, the point is this. And here's my point. Have you ever in your entire life had anybody say to you, Hey, well, you know, 
Um, I had a thou I had two thousand dollars, but um, as she says here, um, what do we need? But I had two thousand dollars, but I said to myself, do I really need two thousand dollars or a thousand enough? So I just put a thousand in a pile and I burned it. Have you ever known anybody to do that? Have you ever known anybody to say, well, I had two million dollars and I decided, do I really need two million dollars? All I really need is a million dollars. So I decided to put that million dollars in a pile and burn it. Now pretend that it's someone who's got four or five billion dollars. Do you think in any lifetime you will ever know or have ever heard of anyone who would ever say that I, I put three, four to five billion dollars in a pile and burned it because I thought that 10 billion was just too much. I just didn't right here. What do we need? I just didn't need it. Do you think that, do you think that makes any sense? Let me tell you what the only thing I think makes sense. If I'm stellar or if I'm, if I'm, if I have created a digital asset and I have a hundred billion of them and I, and, and the, and, and I know but if I go out into the world with that hundred billion XLM, there's only one way that that thing is going to go to crazy prices, which is the whole objective. And that's like Brad Garlinghouse says, by being used. There's only one way that that, that 100 billion XLM goes to high prices. And that is if I can, if I can position that XLM so that it's used by a lot of people. So the only way that I get rid of half of that supply is, is if if someone who some of the core people that I'm trying to get to use it and thus drop the value up are saying not no to a hundred billion, but yes to 50 billion in that scenario, it makes sense for me to go down to 50 billion. That's really the only scenario that I could think of in this whole process. And so what my point in telling you all that is I don't think they build, they burn four to five billion dollars just because they, they, uh, just because they thought that um, they just didn't need it. That does that defies common sense. What does make sense is um, what it's, it's still saying. What, um, what's better, all of nothing or some of something? That's what makes sense. Okay, and so I believe that whoever it is that their plan was to to be the use of this said no, fifty billion, not a hundred billion. And I believe that has something to do with this. I can't prove it. This is just me theorizing. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe and hit the like button and ask your friends and family if they know anybody in their entire life or have ever heard of anybody who said, well, I have $10 billion, but I just decided I didn't need but about five. And so decided to put four or five billion of it in a pile and just burn it. I don't think you have. Thanks for listening.